Okay, so I'm going to tell you something about Vietnam War. It always seems like we have too long of a unit for it, but then it it seems like you don't need a long enough unit. You, you need it to be shorter, right? But then you go in to teach it, and you, by the time you get to the end of it, you're like, why do I feel like, why do I feel like I needed more time? Um, and that's just Vietnam. I don't know why it feels like that. It's just one of those units. I always felt like that with Gilded Age, too. I felt like Gilded Age was too long, but yet there was so much information. And uh, Vietnam always felt like that for me. Also, I love Vietnam. I play so much CCR. I love CCR, but I do play that music. There's so much good music from the Vietnam War. There's the Battle of the Green Beret, um, or the Ballad of the Green uh, Beret, sorry, but that's an amazing song. I like to play both spectrums of the Vietnam War because a lot of times students don't realize that people actually supported the Vietnam War, and that's where we get that silent majority, but they've never really heard of that, which is such a shame because the silent majority is going to follow us, um, even into modern day elections. So let's get into it. We have 8D, which is explain reasons and outcomes for U.S. involvement in foreign countries and the relationship to the domino theory, including the Vietnam War. Now, that domino theory, like I said, had, I had mentioned over in um, early Cold War for Korea is the fact that if one country falls, then they'll all fall. So with that concept in mind, the domino theory is going to say that if, so if Vietnam or any one of these countries in the Pacific region falls, then we have to worry about all these other countries right around that that area, that Asian Pacific area is going to fall and get taken. And these are pivotal countries that we have to try and keep. And so that's really the reasoning of going in there. And um, of course, Vietnam is going to be a failure. I think most people know it was a failure, but it was kind of also one of those things where there wasn't much room for the United States not to go into it. But 8D, you're really talking about the domino theory, the reasons why we enter, and then you will slowly come into the outcomes. Now, the ones that we're, we'll talk about afterwards are outcomes. Um, so it's always great to start with 8D, but it doesn't really take a full um, day. So yes, 8D is the start of it, but it is not a full day's um, lesson. It's more like the warm-up. Um, because almost all of these fall into that. That's really the teeth for the whole freaking unit. So we can't do that. So um, we move on to 8F. And we describe the responses to the Vietnam War, such as the draft, the 26th Amendment, the role of the media, the credibility gap, the silent majority, and the anti-war movement. Now, this is literally like so much. This is so much, okay? So with 8F, um, there's a lot of responses to the war. Like I said, you have the silent majority. You have this group who absolutely support the war. And you're going to know it by the way they vote. They don't go out and protest. All you hear when you think about Vietnam is all of the protest taking place. But there was a large majority who did not protest. They went to work and came home and they had their own views and they showed it on voting day. And that's why you're going to see a conservative vote for, for the continuing of the war. Now, um, you're going to have the 26th Amendment, though, which is also going to be pushed by your protesters. And a very important amendment, really, because if you're going to send me to war, right, if I'm 18 and you're going to send me to war to die for this country, well, I dang sure better be able to vote for this country also. So that's this is where we're going to see that male suffrage lowered to 18. And so, um, or not male, but uh, universal suffrage lowered to 18. And I said male suffrage because the only people getting drafted are men. Right now, everyone can vote at 18 men and women at this point because of the 26th Amendment. But the people who are really fighting for this um, are the ones that are affected by men being drafted. If, if you're if I'm going to have to fight with no I, I have no say unless I dodge. Right. Then I should be able to vote for the people who are making the decisions on my life. Now. The role of the media is going to be really important during the Vietnam War for multiple reasons. You are going to have people like Jane Fonda who are going to lead kind of a movement um, against the Vietnam War. And you can totally get into that if you want. Up to you. Now, um, but you're also going to have the credibility gap that comes from the role of the media. This is the first time that we're really going to have a lot of things broadcasted. This is why it's like the um, the war that takes place, you know, in the living room at, at, at people's couches. They're watching the TV and they are seeing the things that are taking place over there that the media is reporting, but that their uh, politicians are not expressing to them. And they're going to realize that, hey, what my politicians are telling me is not necessarily true. And now they're losing the politicians are losing credibility with the people and they're not trusting them. And there becomes a, a gap between them in that trust area. Um, but again, you still have that silent majority that continues to vote for it. 
but you have that anti-war movement, which is pushed by your youth for the most part. Um, and that is going to be that hippie movement, which is your second lost gen, right? Because you had that lost gen after World War One, which was your flappers and, and your mobsters and things like that. And then you'll have this lost gen, which is your hippies. And they will be kind of moving away from society because they're losing trust within it. So as we go further, your next would be 8E, which is analyze the major events of the Vietnam War, including the escalation of forces, the Tet Offensive, Vietnamization, and the fall of Saigon. Now, this heat really goes through the process of the um of the fall of our war in vietnam it's like the, the start and then kind of the progression to, to us eventually pulling our troops out and leaving okay now um the escalation of forces is going to be L lbj uh lyndon b johnson and he is going to call for more troops to go over to vietnam and fight okay and this is where that um that credibility uh, gap comes from because he's going to be calling for more forces. Hey, we're doing okay, but the Tet Offensive happens, and we realize that it was a huge loss. If we're doing so well, why did we take such a big loss from the Tet Offensive? And um, soon we'll have Nixon who will come in on the idea of Vietnamization, which is slowly pulling our troops out and letting um, letting South Vietnam kind of fight the war for themselves. And we do that eventually, and then we have the fall of Saigon, which is um, South Vietnam falling and it becoming one Vietnam, right? So they do they do come together, and then that's it. And we will move on to 18B. Where is it? Here we go. Explain constitutional issues raised by federal government policy changes during times of significant events, including the 1960s. This is your most loaded teak. Like everything else is pretty simple um, as far as explaining what the major events during Vietnam War were as far as the Vietnam War. But what is going on at, on the home front? There's always something going on on the home front. Anytime that we've got a war, we've got major changes taking place in the United States. So 18B is going to encompass 24B, which is describe the impacts of, hey, describe the impacts of cultural movements in art, music, and literature, such as rock and roll, the Chicano movement, and on American society. So we're actually kind of moving away from that rock and roll, um, original rock and roll, right? We're moving into more of a charged, politically charged um rock and roll that's really focused more on what's going on in the United States and abroad with the United States involved, right? So because rock and roll was politically charged, but it was more politically charged for racial reasons. Now, the political charge that's taking place with the rock and roll um, movement during the 1960s is more because it is politically charged. But we also have the Chicano mural movement going on, um, which is starting to take place. Now, you can mention this, but it's really more of a thing that you talk about in the civil rights era. But um, because it, that's the focus area on civil rights, but you can start to get into the Chicano movement and make sure that they remember, hey, this is the 1960s. While we're focused on Vietnam, there are there are civil rights issues going on because the civil rights, the, the era itself is mostly within the 1960s um, when we see all of the change taking place with regard to the things that have taken place up to this point. So. Yes, we're focusing on Vietnam, but remember, we're still in the 1960s um, because sometimes students, because we we block off these subjects and we hyper focus on certain topics within this era of the 1960s, 1950s to 1960s, students get confused. So make sure that you continue to mention, hey, there are civil rights issues going on during um, the 1950s, Cold War, Korean War era and during the Vietnam time frame. This is all that late 1950s. Um, to 1960s time frame. So the historical civil rights stuff is going on. And we have the mural movement going on. So it's not just certain communities. We also have Hispanic communities who are dealing with um, discrimination issues. And we're going to start to talk about how they deal with it, with art and stuff like that. We also, and let's see, 24A is tied to that, which is describe how the characteristics of and issues of the United States history have been reflected in various genres of art, music, film, and literature. We have 20A which is analyze the effects of landmark U.S. Supreme Court decisions, including Tinker versus Des Moines. This is going to be the case where um, teenagers in school wear black armbands in protest of Vietnam. They are um, reprimanded and it, it, end up, it ends up going to the Supreme Court and they rule in favor of the students. Now, a lot of students will see this and they're like, hey, I, sh I can uh, wear whatever I want. So the idea here is that yes, you um, are allowed, you do not lose your rights. This is really the main concept here. Just because you're a student in a public school doesn't mean that you lose your rights. Just because you are a minor does not mean that you don't have your constitutional rights. The idea once you do enter school is it can't be disruptive. And there's actually another case where it talks about students who wore um, 
I love booby bracelets and shirts. And the school ruled that that was inappropriate. While they were supporting cancer um, research, that the way they went about it, the school felt was disruptive because of the double entendre of the saying. And so the school ended up winning this one, right? But with Tinker versus Des Moines, they did not because it wasn't disruptive. So the idea here is by disruptive, the word lewd, um, profanity, things like that cannot be a part of it. Otherwise it's considered disruptive. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, that you can be like physically disrupting the class, but if you are doing something or wearing something that is lewd or, um, inappropriate in any way, and they can, they can consider that as disruptive, which is also how schools, um, implement dress codes and stuff like that because of this. Now, 19A, I add in here because it is a constitutional issue because of checks and balances, but you can instead move it um, into the important things that are taking place because of the Vietnam War. But the, excuse me, it is describing the impacts of events such as the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and the War Powers Act on the relationship between the legislative and executive branches of government, okay? So the Gulf of Tonkin is going to make it to where the president can send troops abroad without Congress declaring war. Um, and now Congress is going to think that this is actually stepping into their arena because they have to declare war before we can go and get involved in a conflict. This is why the Vietnam War is not really a war. It is a conflict because Congress never declared war. So after the war or the conflict is done, the War Powers Act will be passed, which now makes it to where the president has to notify Congress when sending troops out. And then they're, they can only stay out for so many days before the president then has to notify Congress of his intent to extend their stay. And then Congress has to approve it. So um, and if it doesn't happen, then the troops get pulled back within 48 hours. So this is a um, a way to try and balance that checks and balance issue of whose power is what. OK, um, and they'll get more into that in government. But this is always tested. So you have got to drill this in your students heads. 20B, explain why landmark constitutional amendments have been proposed and ratified from 1877 to the present. Of course, that's Tinker v. Des Moines. There is 22B, which is evaluate various means of achieving quality of political rights, including the 26th Amendment. So you can see why I've grabbed those together. We have 1A, analyze and evaluate the text, intent, meaning and importance of the Declaration of Independence excuse me, and the U.S. Constitution, including the Bill of Rights. And of course, this comes into play with the articles um, under the Constitution um, regarding the powers of each branch when we're dealing with 19A and the Gulf of Tonkin and War Powers Act. Um, and also when we're dealing with Tinker versus Des Moines. And then we have 1B, which is analyze and evaluate the application of these founding principles to historical events in U.S. history. Students have to understand that the reason that amendments and um, acts and stuff like that are passed is because we use the Constitution to um, to support them and to show that, yes, this is uh, definitely a thing that we should do. 22A is, um, let me get over here, identify and analyze methods of expanding the right to participate in the democratic process, including lobbying, nonviolent protesting, litigation, and amendments to the U.S. Constitution. You'll see this one a lot. And again, this is because the kids protested in school. So it counts. And that's pretty much it. So like, Oh, wait, 19A. Did I go over 19A? Yes, I just I just went over 19A. Okay. And 18B. All right. Yes, I went over everything. So it may seem like, like I said, there's not much to Vietnam, um, too, because it's such a focused unit. We're really just focusing on the war and a couple of things that have taken place in the United States. But it, it trust me, it's a beast. Even though there's, there's not a lot there, it's a beast because you're dealing with concepts that students aren't necessarily familiar with. And so um, take your time as you go through it. The, there's always this feeling like you need to rush. Don't rush through Vietnam because it is there is a lot of specific questions that are asked on the star every year. But, um, you know, don't don't fear spreading it out a little bit and taking your time or get through it and then focus on the review of the major parts you know, that focused review of the major parts that are going to most likely be tested over. So um, up to you, but I am warning you, it is a beast. It's short, but it's a beast.